some latest news on the prevalence of PTSD, which have been published this year. And I find it quite alarming, so to say, because one paper says that more than 20% of preschool age children that have been trauma exposed are suffering from PTSD. And um, there is a publication of Ireland uh, that states that the past month um, prevalence of PTSD and complex PTSD lies somewhere between 5 and 70.7%. And the prevalence of PTSD during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was rated in 11 countries and was found uh, to lie around 11%. So PTSD is an issue. It is increasing during the um, pandemia. And um, yeah, I try to get another slide. Yeah, and um, usually PTSD, as we all know, is treated by exposure-based psychotherapy. There are a lot of manuals um, which have proven to be effective. However, um, exposure-based psychotherapy takes long. I'm doing this every day, although I'm, I'm doing research on, on drug targets. I'm, I'm treating patients with uh, exposure-based psychotherapy myself every day, and therefore I know um, sometimes it's torturing for them to repeat over and over the details of traumatic events. And as I already mentioned, it takes a long time until you see an improvement, in particular in complex PTSD. Somebody who suffers from PTSD because of a car accident, a car accident in which he or she did not lose any, any loved one, um, but um, it was just a mere car accident, might improve in a few sessions, but those that suffer from complex PTSD don't usually. Um, and Marina and colleagues published in 2014 um, that PTSD tends to remit in only about a half of individuals after a period of more than three years. Um, and there is a huge number of treatment resistant PTSD patients. And um, yeah, the definition of, of treatment resistance in, in PTSD vary. I, I can hear additional sounds. Okay, maybe there was some, some yeah. Now I'm hearing- If the other, other attendees can mute their mic, please, then um, only the mic of uh, Ulrich is open. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And- um, yeah, the, the definition of treatment resistance in, in PTSD is inconsistent. And um, commonly it is used um, as a 10 point reduction in the CUPS interview, the CUPS 4 interview. There is no rate for CUPS 5 at the moment, but it varies. And there is a publication that was published in October this year that claims that the prevalence of treatment resistant PTSD is around 33%. So approximately one third of PTSD patients, including complex PTSD, of course, um, can be defined as treatment resistant. So there's a huge need, an urgent need to optimize the current treatment situation. And um, yeah, it is, but the RDOC system is part of my title. And as Eric Vermetten already said, um, the two of us have published a paper several years ago. I think it was the first paper on RDOC and PTSD that um, was written. And um, since then, there have been a few others, um, but as it is our paper, I'm focusing on, on, on this manuscript. And um, so the, the main goal of my talk is uh, to identify novel drugs and potential novel drug targets, and the RDOC system can help with this. Um, I think you all know the RDOC system because it has been a topic from the very first beginning of our network here. And, um, but just for repetition, there are domains like um, cognitive systems and positive valence systems, and there are subdomains. Arrivo, un attimo. Hey, Chris. 
um, like the declarative memory, the working memory, and the cognitive control. And there are units of analysis like genes, molecules, cells, neurocircuits, physiology, behaviors, and self reports. The system is um, subject to constant change and it was made to be constantly adapted. Um, yeah, and Eric and me. Um, can you see my next slide? No, it doesn't work at the moment. I'm sorry. Yeah, now it works. Yeah, um, we try to fill in those domains and units of analysis for PTSD, as I said, several years ago. And I'm updating this in a few seconds. And afterwards, I will come to drugs and drug targets. I won't go into every plot you see here. Um, but just to, to, to give an overview, I think I skipped some, some slides, but some, something isn't working here technically, but I will make it anyways. Um, here you can see the domains and the units of analysis again, and um, drug targets are molecular drug targets, and therefore we concentrate on cells, molecules, and genes. So on the units of analysis you find below. Um, here you can see on the molecules part the cycloserine L-dopa uhimbine, which is modulating the adrenal receptor system, and um, there have been identified um, a lot of genetic polymorphisms that have been associated with PTSD in BDNF and other neuroplasticity associated genes in genes of uh, of uh, monoamine transporters like the 5AT genes and so on. And um, there has been identified repetitively the beta and alpha adrenergic system. When you see, uh, when you look under arousal and under genes, you see the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And um, since 2015, um, there have been published many more studies, uh, genetic and non-genetic studies, on the adrenergic system and PTSD. And basically, to, to, to cut a long story short, they, they all find the same. They all identified a hyperadrenergic state in PTSD, which is well known and quite common. And this is reflected in genetic polymorphisms. This is reflected in an increased concentration, blood and urine concentration of noradrenaline and adrenaline and so on. So when we look at potential drug targets, um, adrenal receptors are potential novel or not so novel because we are still using um, medications addressing those system um, in, in the clinic in an off-label mode um, for PTSD. When we look at other units of analysis here, besides the already mentioned polymorphisms in serotonin transporters and receptors, um, there are other systems which have been linked to PTSD regarding genetic polymorphisms. And one of my favorite targets here is the NPS, the neuropeptide S receptor. We come to this later. Um, so NPS is an anxiolytic small neuropeptide, which is related to oxytocin. And like oxytocin has only one single receptor. So in comparison to, for instance, NPY, which has five or six different receptors, this is from the pharmacological or pharmacoengineering um, point of view, more druggable. It's more easy to modulate the, the neuropeptide S and the neuropeptide oxytocin system in comparison to the NPY system because there's only one receptor. And of course, uh, when we look at the other systems, positive valence system, cognitive systems, um, we immediately come to MDMA and psychedelics. And uh, we will have a look at those targets also later. This is just for an overview. I'm trying to get another slide here. Yes. 
So these are the novel domains Eric and me suggested in 2015. There are two novel domains. First is stress and emotion regulation. And the second is maintenance of consciousness. These were the two novel domains in 2015. And again, because we are looking for drug targets, we go to cells, molecules, and genes. And we find under maintenance of consciousness that the HPA axis uh, has been repetitively related to consciousness and to dissociation. Of course, the HPA axis has been related also to mood and to other symptoms, but also to consciousness and to dissociation. So HPA, HPA axis regulators have been um, suggested by many authors to, to constitute um, effective and interesting novel targets for PTSD treatment. And when we look at molecules, um, we find limited evidence for partial opioid antagonists such as naltrexone. And in 2015, we've written that further studies are clearly needed and RCTs are clearly needed. And since then, at least a few RCTs and, and clinical studies have been performed with naltrexone and naloxone. Yeah, since 2015, um, and 16, um, those domains, when we, when we concentrate on the units of analysis, have been enriched, so to say. So there are novel publications um, on molecules, genes. There are unfortunately not that many publications on cells and PTSD. And um, yeah, when we look at molecules, the endocannabinoid system has emerged um, to play a role in PTSD and related uh, trauma spectrum disorders. For instance, there's an interesting publication that is old from 2011, but has been repeated by a number of authors um, who find that um, the cannabinoid receptors are differentially regulated in between stressed and unstressed females and males, not only mice, but also human beings and that uh, those receptors and the whole endocannabinoid system is di differentially regulated um, between PTSD patients, normal controls and depressed patients. And the second systems that a uh, system that has been studied intensely in the last, during the last year, in addition to M MDA, which I have mentioned before, is the oxytocin and oxytocin receptor system. Oxytocin is an anxiolytic peptide, which I've already mentioned, and it's not only modulating sociability, but it's also modulating fear and anxiety. And um, with my working group, we have published a paper on oxytocin um, that shows that the oxytocin receptor in the blood is, yeah, um, an effective biomarker for differentiating HPA excess reactivity types um, in cohorts of female PTSD patients. We will have a look in, um, the, into the details at the end of the talk. So you see the RDOC system um, is constantly evolving. It's getting better. It's uh, filled with more and more details. And um, it's worth looking at the RDOC system to, yeah, to, to identify potential effective novel drugs and drug targets for PTSD and also for other um, psychiatric disorders. May I just interject one question, Oli, if, you, if you're okay with that? On this yeah. slide, yet the, if you go back one slide. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see any, any population of the behavior and the physiology in that cluster of complex PTSD. Is there no literature yet or what's the I reason found, why that is I empty? I have found no literature that would fit into those, into those cells basically. And maybe if we have a closer look, I've started this um, a few days ago, so to say, but, but uh, so far I've, no, I've not found, if, if you are aware of a publication, I would be happy if, if you could tell us, but at the moment, yeah, um, for social processes, um, I've not found any novel publication, so to say. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, well, th that could be looked in further later. Sure, yeah, that could yeah, be yeah. another paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. We should look into this uh, in further detail. You're very right. Yeah, so if we fuse, um, or if I summarize what I've said, um, if we summarize what, what I've extracted from the RDOC system regarding um, potential drug targets and drugs for PTSD, we have um, anxiolytic neuropeptides like oxytocin and neuropeptide S. We have psychedelics and particular MDMA. We have adrenal receptor antagonists, sorry for, for the writing mistakes here, I was very much in a hurry, like prazosine, doxazosine, and the beta receptor antagonist propranolol. We have opioid antagonists like naloxone and naltrexone, and we have HPA axis modulators, in particular FKBP51 antagonists. Um, FKBP51 is an inhibitor of the glucocorticoid receptor, and this a strong HPA axis modulator. Oxytocin, I've already mentioned as an anxiolytic neuropeptide, and I've mentioned the endocannabinoid system. Then I went into the latest reviews and chapters. There are a lot of re reviews, I won't go into detail here, on NMDA-assisted psychotherapy and PTSD. And um, almost all of them are showing um, excellent results and are, yeah, are telling us that an MMDA is, so to say, the, the novel and most effective novel drug for PTSD treatment, or at least for um, pharmacother uh, drug treatment assisted psychotherapy and PTSD. And um, then I went for looking for additional reviews on drug targets and potential novel drugs on PTSD. And I found two interesting reviews. Um, one has been published in October in Expert Opinion on Pharmacotherapy, and the other um, is two years old, published 2019, published in the Handbook of Behavioral Neuroscience. And I looked for additional um, as I said, drug targets that I've not been uh, mentioning so far, I've not mentioned so far. Um, regarding the HPA axis, Mifepristone has been studied, which I did not know before in a clinical study. Mifepristone is a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist. And um, at first, it is not easy to understand because when you think of PTSD patients which have a lower H um, cortisol um, concentration in the blood and in the urine, you have to think another step further. This lower cortisol concentration derives from a hyperactive HPA axis. And the hyperactive HPA axis, in turn, derives from a hypersensitive glucocorticoid receptor. And therefore, mifepristone as a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, um, this was the hypothesis, and it proved to be true, at least in one study or in two studies, um, was thought to be effective in PTSD. I think, as I said, there are one or two studies. It has to be studied further, but I think it's a, it's a promising result. I found um, in those reviews additional studies on estradiol. Estradiol was given only to women with PTSD, and um, those studies found an improvement in fear extinction and a decrease in anxiety in PTSD, female PTSD patients treated with estradiol. And there are several papers on substances and drugs modulating neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation is not only a target system in PTSD and trauma spectrum disorders, but in the entire um, psychiatric spectrum, so to say. And um, yeah, there is one sub sub substance also I did not know before. It's Brexpiprazol. Brexpiprazol is a partial D2 receptor antagonist and has been shown to be effectively reducing PTSD-associated flashbacks and nightmares. So the dopaminergic system, dopaminergic neurotransmission seems to be somehow dysfunctional in PTSD, 
although there are other authors that claim that um, the disturbance in the dopaminergic system is so to say the other way around, that uh, we should use not dopamine antagonists, but dopamine agonists, like for instance, uh, psychedelics. So um, it might be that uh, this story is very complicated within uh, dopaminergic systems and that in the one part of the brain, so to say, antagonism is needed and in other parts or regions of the brain, a stimulation of the dopaminergic system is needed, but this has to be clarified in future studies. And of course, there are NMDA antagonists like D-cycloserine, um, which have repetitively been shown to be effective in PTSD in particular effective against uh, nightmares also. And I found um, a very recent study. There is only one study on this topic. Um, it studied the substance uh, trihexyphenidyl, which is the strongest so far available cholinergic antagonist. And um, as this was uh, not an RCT, um, they published it on, I think, impact factor five or something, but it's very promising. This trihexyphenidyl, this cholinergic antagonist, anticholinergic substance, also reduced the entire PTSD symptom, not only several, uh, the, the distinct symptoms, but the entire syndrome, so to say. So now we have an overview over the r drug system, over the literature and the different drug targets. Yeah, now I show you at the end of my talk, I hope that I have uh, two or three minutes time. Eric, what do you say? Okay. You're good. Yes. Yes, you're okay. good. Go, go ahead to three minutes or five. That, that, that'd be fine. Then we have uh, okay. about 10 okay. minutes for the, for the discussion. Rick. Yeah. So I gave you a lot of overviews and I want to go um, a bit more into detail now by showing a part of my own data. I told you that uh, personally, I believe that anxiolytic neuropeptides are um, potential novel effective drug targets for PTSD. And now I tell you why. Um, in 2017, uh, we published uh, together with the Technical University of Munich, um, um, a randomized control studies, uh, study that we performed in a cohort of female PTSD patients. And we have exposed those uh, female PTSD patients to a standardized um, trauma script challenge. And um, those patients were exposed to that with and without intranasal oxytocin pretreatment. And we found that intranasal oxytocin significantly reduced the PTSD symptoms elicited um, by this trauma script challenge. What uh, we did not like is that oxytocin um, um, stimulated the sympathetic nervous system because, as I said at the beginning, we know that PTSD patients have um, an elevated uh, sympathetic nervous system anyways. So this is a facet that we don't like at the moment, but in spite of this, oxytocin is, and this has been proven um, in the last two or three years by, by other colleagues from other countries, um, who also found that oxytocin is effective in PTSD, we found that oxytocin effectively reduces PTSD symptoms. So the question is, how long does oxytocin do this? I don't think that one shot of intranasal oxytocin is constantly reducing PTSD, but I can imagine that um, because oxytocin is predominantly reducing avoidance behavior, that this substance like MDMA would also be suitable for drug-assisted pharmacotherapy, drug-assisted exposure-based therapy. So this was the RCT. Mm, and then, oh, this is the wrong. 
um, we made another study which we published this year. This was also done in patients, but this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is a biomarker study. So we have identified, as I mentioned before, several subtypes, HPA access responsivity subtypes in PTSD. When you look in, in, at total cohorts of PTSD patients, you find that in general, PTSD patients have a um, um, lower cortisol output in the urine and the blood, lower ACTH output, and so on. And um, this is due to, as I already mentioned, an overactive HPA access. And um, we analyzed, because this was a biomarker study and not like the study before a treatment study, oxytocin concentration and um, on the mRNA level, oxytocin receptor expression in the different HPA access responsivity subtypes. And as you can see below, we found that the hyper-responsive HPA access subtypes, so the one that absolutely um, produces no cortisol in a trial social stress test or in, in, or in any other stress test, that um, they have a significantly lower oxytocin receptor mRNA concentration in the blood. And we have repeated this, this is not published, the repetition, in three other cohorts. And um, we can predict the HPA access response type in PTSD patients, but not in normal controls, by the way, um, by the amount of oxytocin receptor mRNA. So we have two studies and, and several other studies that are not shown here that are pointing um, towards uh, a major role of oxytocin and the oxytocin, oxytocin receptor system in PTSD. Yeah, then I've told you about NPS. We were not able so far to do, uh, to perform studies with neuropeptide S and PTSD patients because so far the FDA has not approved NPS for the use in humans. We are working on this. As you know, this is quite expensive and requires a lot of studies that um, until you are allowed to test a novel substance, even though NPS as an, is, an, is not a classical drug, but an endogenous substance in humans. Oxytocin has been available before and it is used uh, in gynecology, gynecology and NPS is not available. So we um, did most of the experiments in mice and we did some biomarker studies in humans. We published a lot um, on NPS and PTSD and stress-related disorders in mouse models and to cut a long story short, um, the first finding several years ago was that 30 minutes after intranasal administration of a fluorescence labeled NPS molecule, you find it in those beautiful, huge uh, hippocampal neurons. And this enrichment in hippocampal neurons goes along with a strong anxiolytical uh, activity of NPS in mice. I have um, copied two um, behavioral anxiolysis tests below the dark light test. And um, there are two strains of mice, the high anxiety behavior mice, uh, which are usually even resistant to the treatment with benzodiazepines. But as you can see here, after treatment with NPS, the time that those mice spent in the light compartment, so mice are afraid of entering lit compartments, um, increases. Benzodiazepines won't do this in the strain. And um, the same accounts for um, a certain dosage of NPS in normal wild type, like six mice. And we've done a lot of other studies, which I have no time to present here, and found in which brain regions NPS is exerting its effects. And there are two brain regions. One is published. It's the ventral hippocampus, and the other, which is not yet published, is the infralimbic cortex. And we also found that NPS, like oxytocin, you remember that I showed you that oxytocin receptor concentration varies between individuals of different HPA access responder types. This also accounts for NPS and the receptor. So both of those anxiolytic neuropeptides are not only regulated in 
PTSD or PTSD-like mouse models, um, but they are also regulated by the HPA axis. And oxytocin is regulating in turn HPA axis reactivity. So it's a, it's a very complex system. Yeah, and this is what we have submitted now. Um, because I ran off out of time, I cut a long story short. You should concentrate on the figure B left below. The black dots are representing mice that have been treated with NPS. And this time um, it has been not in, injected intranasally, but, but been injected into a ventricular cannula. And the white dots represent the placebo treated mice. And um, yeah, they, they receive an electric foot shock. And then you measure, it's a class, classical fear conditioning paradigm, you measure fear conditioning, and you find that the NPS treated mice they express no fear at all. And this is what we see in all mouse models. Then we thought this might depend on the effect of NPS to influence the, the, the motoric capability of mice. It modulates the motoric, um, but it does not, not, to not to an extent that would explain uh, those results. On the right side, you can see the startle reflex. Again, mice treated with NPS um, after an electric foot shock have a reduced expression of the starter reflex. At the moment, we are working on the, um, yeah, I hope that it will work someday um, together with, with other groups um, on the allowance, so to say, of the FDA and the B form in Germany um, to, to allow us, that, that would enable us to study NPS also in human beings. But I think this will take two or three years until we will get this allowance. Yeah, but I think those mouse experiments are very promising and the oxytocin experiments are very promising. And uh, yeah, these were two examples of two, in my eyes, promising drug targets for PTSD. I started with the overview. There are more promising PTSD targets. And I think maybe a combination um, of all of them that I've presented to you um, might help or might uh, help um, in particular for drug-assisted exposure-based psychotherapy. So here's a summary. I've told you about the opioid system. Facets of the opioid system seems to be upregulated in stress-related disorders. Um, I've told you about the hyperadrenergic state and about substances such as doxazosin that might uh, that are reducing those overactivity and are reducing also PTSD symptoms. I've told you about the the novel pub very recent publications on um, anticholinergic substances and PTSD, about the dopaminergic paradoxon in PTSD which um, shows that the dopaminergic system seems to be um, regulated differentially in, in PTSD and PTSD-like states and animal SSRIs, we all know, um, are effective at least in a proportion of PTSD patients. I've told you about the clinical studies on the glucocorticoid receptor antagonist mifepristone on endocannabinoids on NMDA uh, receptor agonists like d cycloserine and um, I've just shown you details on anxiolytic neuropeptides. I thank you for your patience. Well, th that is excellent, uh, excellent. Um, uh, and those who have, uh, thank you so much, uh, Uli, for delivering a, a, a wonderful presentation. And those who thought that the pipeline was sort of empty in PTSD compounds, then you, you, you've given us some, some light at the end of the tunnel, I should say. It's a metaphor that's often used these days. Yeah. Um, but, yes. uh, and against against a background of the RDOC matrix. I think that is extremely important for us to try to think in, I want to think in, in RDOC terms, but it is a matrix that is beautifully designed and, and has a, a great architecture. As long as you take for granted these extra categories that um, 
we both have recognized that are lacking uh, to understand uh, the yeah. symptomatology and the phenomenology of, of PTSD. Now, before we go into a discussion, I see that it's four minutes to the bottom of the hour. And uh, with, with Eric still with us and, and Uli here, is it okay for you to extend our with maybe 10 minutes? Because I would like to give some breath to, 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 the, to the audience. And I saw that... Um, uh, Ingrid Philippens is with us, and 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 Miriam van Zuyden is with us. So that 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 that, that and and others that um, may have questions uh, for for Uli. For Uli, is that okay? Then, if you have to go, then you have to um, then you have to um, of course chime off. But um, we would keep this this open until ten after the half of the hour. So that's forty. Okay, that's fine with me because I'm today from today on I'm on holidays yeah. anyways. Okay, okay, great. So we'll give the floor and um, the, the question. Maybe Joseph, you wanted to start. I think there are a couple of uh, questions, and uh, let's start with question to uh, Erika. And this is uh, the question is about the gender difference of the prevalence of PTSD and uh, recent finding about treatment outcome difference. So the question is about the gender yeah. prevalence yeah. and it's treatment a, it's outcome difference, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Yeah, it's a very important question. And as I um, mentioned already in my talk, um, when I look at my own data, um, I've, I've studied predominantly females because female patients are presenting much more often in uh, trauma wards and trauma outpatient units. And when we go into literature, we see huge differences, both regarding prevalence and treatment. And um, Carrie Ressler, um, who, who has done a very great job on analyzing the genome and epigenome of PTSD, he found, so to say, several molecular reasons for this. And I've mentioned during my talk estradiol, and Kerry Ressler has studied the, yeah, the estradiol receptor, the ER, and found not only uh, genetic polymorphisms, but also epigenetic loci that are different between males and females. And of course, females have higher estradiol levels, have a higher uh, estradiol um, receptor system activity. By dis but despite of that, um, the, re uh, the estradiol receptor is also active in males and due to genetic polymorphisms and epigenetic loci differences, so to say epigenetic polymorphisms, um, the, um, the, the prevalence and the treatment outcomes differ between the two biological sexes. This is not the only reason, but one very important reason. And usually studies are not, and therefore this question is very important, are not addressing this issue. So all of us should ideally, and I'm talking also to myself, um, I studied only females because, as I said, they are approaching me more often than males, and it's more easy to recruit a female PTSD cohort than a male cohort, but we should care more for those differences. This is very, very important, and the Istra dual system is one of the reasons, but, not, but certainly not the only one. So thank you. Maybe another question I'd like to also ask for Arik, uh, Arik's uh, help on this, and it, it may be related to both of you. So if, if, if I just go back to the RDoC uh, template and recognition of PTSD is a disorder of stress regulation. So stress regulation was one of the categories that was added to the RDoC, but also consciousness and regulation of consciousness. Now, Arik was talking about paratraumatic dissociation, which is sort of relevant for consciousness regulation, maybe, but also stress regulation. So my question is, are these biological substrates that we may need to enter in the RDoC component, are they similar or are they different in these two categories? What are your thoughts on that? Maybe maybe you go first, I'm out, or Eric, or? I'm, I'm, out of, I'm out of my depth uh, uh, adjudicating the um, subsystems uh, relevance to symptoms other than say, that any uh, leap or jump between domains 
between domains, between levels of analysis, biology, um, genetics, and others, um, uh, uh, creates major difficulties uh, in um, assuming um, unequivocal con connection and out of context. I think that uh, we are in a highly complex uh, system so that uh, we need to have more, much more data right, that is being produced in different laboratories to have all the different dots connect into some uh, larger network uh, um, uh, understanding uh, uh, of, the, of the biology. So I think that the task for, um, for biological research is to create more dots and see how they connect, how they reconnect, and how they deal with the complexity of the context, which is often human context. So I, I, other than this very general, point uh, we I, I'm waiting for for people to clarify the way if, if um, I may on, if on I it. may add on yes go ahead add to this yeah I, I fully agree and I'd like to add that we for for identifying those networks that Professor Shalaf has already mentioned has just mentioned um, we should not stick to diagnoses so we we um, should should uh, strive for a novel taxonomy or the novel taxonomy will be the result of the identification of those novel neurobiological networks. So one day we won't talk, maybe we won't talk about PTSD anymore, but uh, like in neurology about some receptor disorders, but maybe just this is just a dream, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you, That's, that, that is a challenging thought. Um, uh, Joseph, Joseph, yeah. you wanted there, to comment on that? There is another add? question from Alex. And the question uh, is for Arik, but I think Ulrike, you can also give your thoughts about this. And the question is about the difference uh, between children versus adult uh, regarding the trajectory uh, of post COVID. And what is uh, your thoughts, you know, Arik, your thoughts specifically about the, you know, the, the uh, COVID, post-COVID, and Ul Ulrika is uh, about your thought about the treatment and the pathology of children versus adult. Arik, you can go ahead, start, Ulrika. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't uh, we don't know we are hit with neurological conditions post-covid neurological conditions in children uh, uh, we are uh, hit with some uh, uh, psychological conditions we, we still don't know the one thing that emerges from studies is that kids brain uh, is uh, at least at early age is uh, capable of adjusting of adjusting for uh, difficulties or for uh, 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 dysfunction for neurological dysfunction. Uh, clinically, I'm, I'm sorry to, to say that the old uh, the old wisdom emerges from World War II children which is children's outcome during, this was the London uh, bombing. Uh, this is really depend on the integrity of the adult supportive system and on the, uh, on the reactivity of, of the surrounding adults. Children really learn and, 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 and adapt a major age. So uh, from the perspective I tried to, um, to present today, Children resilience is quite a uh, an issue of uh, supportive adults, and the imprinting, uh, the the provision of meaningfulness, uh, catastroph uh, catastrophic life is, is really. Bad. So if you keep this adaptive system, 
uh, uh, solid and functional, uh, you should worry less mm -hmm. about how kids are going to uh, relate to the stress. Kids mm -hmm. will react to other things that are not stressful for us, like the loss of years of education, loss of years of socializing with other children, loss of years of interacting with peers, on learning uh, in, in human interactions. So in addition to the, to the actual stressor, uh, kids are, we don't, we don't really um, fathom that. Kids are, are submitted to their own uh, challenges uh, in the COVID, which might have to do with socialization, with peer relationship, with uh, addiction to, uh, <laughs> addiction to uh, uh, internet and, and so on and so forth. We're not yet there to understand uh, where this is going to lead. Yeah.